Hello, I'm Chuck Wolf, Chief Executive for Charles J. Wolf Associates, LLC. As a motivational speaker and a leadership consultant, and executive coach and trainer, I often work with very successful people in their companies. Since many can't afford a professional, I volunteer to host a radio talk show called The Emotion Roadmap, Take the Wheel and Control How You Feel, on a nonprofit community radio station in Bridgeport, Connecticut, WPKN. My reason for doing the show is to share with as many people as possible this wonderful process for helping people manage their own emotions and their relationships with others. My goal is for everyone listening to learn to use the Emotion Roadmap to make life better. As you listen to me, help others, I hope you are also learning. As a Simsbury resident, I'm delighted to be able to make the show available through Simsbury TV. To learn more, go to my website, www.emotionroadmap.com. Thank you for listening and watching. This is Chuck Wolf. You're listening to the Emotion Roadmap. Take the wheel and control how you feel. And I'm very pleased that I have as a guest today, Mark Brackett. Mark is the director for the Center for Emotional Intelligence at Yale University. And I've known Mark and worked with Mark uh, since the early 2000s um, in schools. And I'm just I want to say that uh, Mark has done some incredible um, work in this area of raising emotional literacy and increasing emotional management skills for children in schools and all the surrounding people and uh, the administrators, the faculty, the parents. It's just really approached schools in a very holistic way that is generating some amazing benefits to children all across the world. Actually, the program called RULER is working everywhere, and it's an acronym for Recognize, Understand, Label, and Express, and Regulate Emotions. And um, I was glad to be there at the early part of this and got to meet Mark's Uncle Marvin, and Mark is going to be talking about his new book, Permission to Feel. And I, I just, I, I know that if I mention Yale University and I mentioned it's Dr. Mark Brackett, that people might think it's a very academic book. I have to say that in reading it, I thought it was wonderful, easily accessible, um, really beneficial to everybody and anybody that might want to pick it up. It isn't just about schools. It's really about helping everybody become much better at being more emotionally intelligent. And in my own show, those of you that are regular listeners, you know that um, one of the things that I really hope to create through this work and this emotion roadmap is the whole way that we manage and we, we work with people and we talk to people and we relate to people. Because I think that on our planet, we have, um, we, have, we have some really challenging situations that all of us face. And I, uh, one of the things that's a message for me is I really think that if we can help people to create more inner peace by helping them to deal with the own, their own struggles with emotion management and helping them to learn how to regulate their emotions more effectively. And, and, and again, Mark's book has a wonderful list of ideas and techniques for doing that. And I think if we create more inner peace for all of us, that we have a better chance of really experiencing world peace. And while I have big goals, I thought it was really interesting, Mark, that at the end of your book, I think it was a third grade student who said, what he hopes happens as a result of Ruler is we get world peace. And that was very consistent with the message that I give out on my show. So um, I, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to talk with us about your book. And I thought if, I, I know you're very proud, and, and I'm sure your uncle would be very proud of you today, about what you've been able to accomplish with, with what the two of you dreamed about, and he was so amazingly helpful to you in your early years. Um, I thought maybe we could start by talking about your Uncle Marvin a little bit and how this all got started. Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me, uh, Chuck, and I appreciate the time. The, um, you know, I was a kid who was uh, challenged in many areas. Uh, as I revealed in my book, I was abused as a child that I didn't disclose until I was almost a teenager um, because... I was threatened, you know, that if I shared, I would be in trouble and my family would be in trouble. Um, so what happens to a kid who has those experiences is they shut down, right? They suppress their feelings. They eat their feelings. You know, the list goes on. Um, I also had two parents who loved me dearly, but they were not, you know, they didn't go to the school of emotional intelligence. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, my mom had a lot of anxiety and 
just really didn't know how to deal with her feelings, nor mine. And my father was a tough guy from the Bronx who um, basically just wanted me to be a tough guy. And so with all the challenges that I had, um, you know, I suppressed my feelings and did other things that were not helpful. Um, but luckily, uh, by some wave of a magic wand, my uncle Marvin uh, stayed with us frequently um, during these difficult times when I got older. And um, he was a band leader uh, in the Catskill Mountains by night and a teacher by day. And he was literally writing a program about emotional intelligence in the 1960s and 70s um, and would come and stay at our house and we would talk about feelings. And he was the first adult in my life who really recognized me as a, as a person who had very difficult feelings, who needed to talk about them. And so obviously what I argue is that Uncle Marvin gave me the permission to feel. Um, meaning that I had the permission to feel all of my emotions. They were shame and hatred and anger and fear. And, but I also had the permission to express those feelings, which was not present in my early life. Um, so that's why I dedicate the book to him. And, um, you know, long story short with Uncle Marvin is that, you know, once I started feeling better about myself in middle school and high school, um, went to college and... I started having anxiety problems in college and not sure, not being really sure what I wanted to do with my life. And uh, I'm in therapy. Um, it's at the time when Dan Goldman's book on emotional intelligence came out that became a big bestseller. And I read that book and I was like, I think this is everything Uncle Marvin did 20 years ago. <laughs> so I called my uncle and I pulled him out of retirement. And I said, Uncle Marvin, I think we have to write a curriculum. Like everything that you worked with me on as a child and everything that you did as a teacher, let's make it into a curriculum. And that's, you know, we met around those times um, when, it, when we first started getting it published. It took us a long time to write it, a long time to get it published. Uh, but that was really the beginning of my career, uh, which was collaborating with my uncle. And in that process, um, I learned about Peter Salovey and Jack Mayer and got my doctorate with Jack and then did a postdoc with Peter and tested up my career now at Yale. So let me so just say a little bit before short. before you go on, Mark, just for people who don't know. So Dan Goleman is probably the most well-known person in emotional intelligence because of the book he published in 1995 called Emotional Intelligence and Why It Might mat Matter More Than IQ. And Dan was a, is a brilliant writer and it collected a lot of ideas about social and emotional competencies. But he titled this book Emotional Intelligence. That's a different story. But the people that were the pioneers in emotional intelligence, the people that wrote that seminal article in the 19, 1990, I guess, initially, uh, it was it was Jack Mayer that Mark just mentioned, a University of New Hampshire psychologist, and Peter Salovey, who, when I first met him and started to work with him, was he was the department chairperson at um, Yale University for Psychology. And since that time, he's got a series of internal promotions, and now he's president of Yale. And Mark works for him, I think, directly, right, as the director for the center? Um, and, well, not directly, but yes, we are still close, close collaborators and... Um, you know, we're trying to make Yale an emotionally intelligent university. Um, so obviously we have to do that together. Right. And also I wanted to just mention one thing. When I when I first got to meet you when it was in the early part of your career in this and um, and met your Uncle Marvin, I remember talking about a story that I, I still share. I was speaking to 125 coaches um, yesterday uh, about, you know, emotional intelligence and the emotional roadmap that I – that I uh, work with and created, and but I also wanted to tell him the story about a little bit about Ruler because when I first got exposed to Ruler, this was so impressive to me. You were telling me about your uncle Marvin and, and about his ability to make connections to kids in schools. And by the way, just something interesting: he taught in Monticello schools, and one of my wife's first cousins knew him. She was the social worker in the school. And so she knew of Marvin, and she knew some of the things that I told her that I had discovered. But the, the story that was so impressive to me, Mark, when I first heard it was, um, I remember that your uncle had talked to kids, and I guess he was teaching something. I think the, the example was about Caesar and going to the Roman Senate and saying that to the senators that this is something that you will have to do. This is something that we are going to do in Rome, and you need all to support it. And while that was just a set of facts, and if the kids didn't know who Caesar or Rome was, he made it come alive by asking them, have you ever had somebody tell you you had to do something you didn't necessarily want to do? Or have you ever acted like Caesar where you were making other? 
and and how did that make you feel? And I, I that story resonated with me forever, <laughs> and I continue yeah. to tell it because it I mean it really captured how everything changes when you when you start to think about school subject matter like history, like literature, and how it makes you feel, and how the people in those stories were feeling. And I, I mean that to me was the harder ruler when you first started off. You know, it was, and that was what Uncle Marvin, you know, invented in his classroom back in the 1960s and 70s. A um, quick side story is that I was recently giving a, a talk on my book and um, in Westchester, New York, and I was sharing, like, the history of Ruler and my Uncle Marvin, and I had people do this reflection. I'm like, well, did you have an Uncle Marvin like I did? And one gentleman stood up and he goes, well, Mark, my Uncle Marvin was your Uncle Marvin. <laughs> and I was like, what That's are you funny. talking about? He's like, your uncle was my social studies teacher 45 years ago. Wow. And I got to interview him, and I was just blown away by um, his memory of my uncle as his teacher from 45 years ago. And he talked exactly about what you're saying, Chuck, which was this intersection of like history and personal feelings and how they how you know you can tell stories and weave it into the curriculum and go back to the stories and that really was Marvin's geniusness um, the challenge that we had with ruler was that you know not everybody was uncle Marvin in the classroom right and um, Marvin was obviously a very comfortable with feelings and very skilled at dealing with feelings um, both you know mostly have his kids feelings but um, what we found was the the most difficult challenge uh, with implementing ruler was that the adults who were teaching kids were not necessarily comfortable talking about emotions, especially the strong negative ones like anxiety and fear and despair. So that's when we had to go back to the drawing board and really think about, well, what do we need to do for adult development? Right? What do we need to do to support the teachers in building their own emotional intelligence skills so they were both the role models for this work and also comfortable in doing the instruction in the classroom. Well, that's really interesting because I, you know, and it's interesting, again, in your book, which I, I again, I want to encourage everybody, not just people in schools, to, to go out and buy it. I think it's a great book that helps people understand your own journey and some of the challenges you faced, how your uncle was meaningful to you, but all the lessons, life lessons that you've learned, not just on your own and not just from your uncle, but with all the educators that you work with over the years and all the, and, and the wonderful stories that you tell about kids and, and teachers and, and others who have come up to you. And even some of the, I, I, I really like some of the letters I think that for, from people who had had your uncle as a, as a teacher and yep. some of the story that you just told. So I think it's a really accessible book. And I just, I, I, I encourage people to think about the idea that we, we don't always allow ourselves to feel things, and, and sometimes it's really hard for us to express our emotions, as you point out in the book, and, and to allow others to know how we feel because it makes us feel so vulnerable, and that some of what you run into in schools are people that think that it's all about teaching. It's, it's kind of like in business where people are so focused on profitability often, or even in a nonprofit that you have to have a revenue stream or we don't get to be here. But in schools, it's all about the test scores these days, and yet at the same time, time you have shown uh, such enormous benefit even on test scores and on leadership and on social and, and other kinds of behaviors being so much more appropriate when kids go through these, these these lessons and and yet when you talk about it to people who have just aren't, you know aren't really on board it's a it's a tough sell initially and yet one of the things that I loved about the ruler program different than some of the other social and emotional learning programs out there is that it's very evidence-based and that you're drawing on real evidence and support through research that you've done that have shown these enormous benefits that include higher test scores so perhaps you could talk a bit about that but again I want to encourage everybody this isn't just for schools well I think the reason why you know my book is, is I wrote in particular my book is because I didn't want you know we've been, we've done so much work in schools and had so many great results I wanted to make these ideas available to a larger audience you know having now done work in the corporate sector you know and and other with other nonprofits um, you know I still find you know because the adults who are managing and leading the companies of today have not had right, an adequate education and emotional intelligence, 
it's hard for them to implement this work. You know, and I thought, you know, what I could share, Chuck, is a little bit about why I called the book Permission to Feel. You know, in addition to my story with Uncle Marvin, is that, you know, as someone who has the privilege of running a center called the Center for Emotional Intelligence, most people were saying to me, well, why aren't you calling your book like Emotional Intelligence (laughs) 5.0 or something like that? Or, you know, Emotional Intelligence, key to success in life. And what I realized is that, you know, 1990, the theory of emotional intelligence was written by Peter and Jack. 1995, Dan writes his uh, book on emotional intelligence. Same year, uh, the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, CASEL, is formed to help support school-based programming. You know, five years later, the positive psychology movement is released and, and mindfulness work and is, is kind of um, going to scale. And yet here we are in 2019 with the suicide rates in our nation having gone up 28% in the last two decades, having anxiety disorders at all-time highs. Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Bullying has not gone down in our nation's schools. Workplace and school engagement are at all-time highs. And so I I question, you know, why is it that, you know, emotional intelligence has been in our our environment for 30 years, and everybody's saying they're doing work on social and emotional learning in their schools, but yet the data are looking really bad, you know, for our nation's youth. And I really think it has come down to the fact that we don't want to do the hard work. You know, that this is not a piecemeal assembly, you know, classroom kit. It really is about creating emotionally intelligent systems where leaders are modeling these skills, where teachers are developing them and modeling them, where students are building them, and where parents themselves are also learning these things. Because until then, I think that we're not going to really have the impact that we want, you know, with these important skills. So you talk about it in terms of uh, one of the one of the uh, lessons in your book is that you became a black belt, and you talk about the experience in your first <laughs> going for the yellow belt, and that wasn't a that wasn't a good experience for you, and also how difficult it was when you were disappointed in yourself and in what happened and and how how it was so difficult not, not only for you but for your parents to understand how to deal with you because we don't have a lot of education and for most of us today who are listening to this show there hasn't been a lot of education and a lot of information about how to be more emotionally intelligent so while there's a lot of talk about it i think there's just a lot of talk about it and i think when you talked about going for your initial black belt but then the 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 fifth level i think i think it took it 10 years and and i think that's what you're saying is so while it's one thing to listen and think about how i want to be more emotionally intelligent doing the work to actually become more emotionally intelligent there's some effort and energy that isn't being expended yet and I don't know, you know, when a, for, for, for a change to happen, you need a compelling vision. I think it's there, but the pressure maybe hasn't been great enough, except it is becoming great enough. And so hopefully with real clear actions, and your book's one of the clear actions, hopefully my show is too, The Emotion Roadmap, but it's also the idea that you've got to be willing to do the work. Exactly. And I think that's our biggest challenge right now is that oftentimes the, the unhelpful strategies, right, the drinking the extra alcoholic beverage, the staying in bed and not exercising, you know, the eating junk food, the yelling, the screaming, the suppressing, the repressing, right? You don't need to get a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, or a doctorate, you know, in how to use those strategies. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But, um, you know, the ones that, you know, moving away from negative self-talk and making it more positive self-talk or you know, getting the right amount of sleep or eating the right foods or, you know, scheduling the time to exercise. Like, that's a lot of effort. And we are a species that wants immediate gratification, and we, our brains basically lie to us. You know, like, even this morning, my brain was like, I could have, I'm, I'm in the Seattle public schools and the Highline schools this week and working with Microsoft. And um, my... Uh, you know, I've been, I'm, I'm going to dedicate myself, I'm going to exercise this morning, and then I got up in my bed, and I'm, I'm like, oh, I'm so tired. I really, <laughs> you know, I should give myself, you know, I really deserve the rest. Right. But the truth is, I really need to exercise. 
Um, but my brain tells me, no, Mark, you're going to feel better if you just lie here in bed and do nothing. And so that's the hard part, right, is challenging ourselves, especially the, the thinking that we have that makes us not do the things that are best for us. And so my question is, you know, to our, to our society is that we have to start that, you know, I would like to start it in the womb, to be honest with you, because how parents feel during pregnancy is influential to uh, the fetus. And then from birth and, you know, preschool, kindergarten, et cetera, um, it's a developmental pathway. So what are we doing in our preschools to support healthy emotional development? What are we doing in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade? And you can imagine that just like there are requirements for a black belt, like you got to do a basic, you know, uh, punch for a yellow belt and a front kick and a, you know, how to block a punch. But, um, you know, what you get for yellow belt, blue belt, red belt are different. They're fancier, more challenging moves. Well, the same thing applies to our emotional life, right? Dealing with the complexities of middle school and reputation, you know, and puberty, Right, that alone, you know, is is so challenging. But if we were to prepare kids developmentally, you know, for the different aspects of their life, I think we'd have a healthier society. Well, one of the things I'm encouraging people to do these days is, a, a, you know, a couple of thoughtful things. And, and again, um, there's lots of information and a couple of things that you mentioned in your book are things that I encourage people to do too, which is a self-talk and, and sort of along the lines of the meta moment where you stop and you think before you just react. And by the way, I thought some of your reactions that were possible that you didn't do were very funny. I just thought that I just made me laugh out loud because sometimes when somebody challenges you and you, you have a comeback that would be comical, but also be defeating because it would just put the person down and also make them not think of you as the emotion scientist you want them to, right. to, to think of exactly. you as. Um, but one of the things that strikes me and as a way of helping people who are listening to this is in terms of, you know, getting more in touch with your feelings. Cause to me, Mark, feelings are like breathing. You know, you, do, you just, you don't think you're breathing. You don't think about breathing until it's labored or you're, you're struggling for some reason you went up a flight of stairs or there's something really wrong with you and that's true about emotions too we don't not often think about them and so when you ask yourself how are you feeling and and I love the the opening cover of your book with the with the mood meter and the different quadrants and all the different words that that tell you whether you're in your pleasant category or unpleasant category whether you have high energy or on low energy I think that's all great but one of the things I've asked people to do is just take your phone and just three times a day like at 10 30 and 2 30 and 7 30 and check in with yourself and just ask how am i feeling and is how i'm feeling helpful and if by chance it's not is there something more ideal to feel because 10 30 is a good time because you know when you come in the beginning of the day you think you know what you're going to get done and you got a list that you want to work on by 10 30 you know that's not going to happen and that other things have shown up. But it's also a good checkpoint for you to stop and kind of think about, hey, wait a minute, what's actually going on now? How am I feeling? And if it's not helpful, what would be ideal to feel? And then the same thing at 2.30, because around 2.30, you know you only got a couple hours left. And did you get distracted? Are you in doing something that's interesting and maybe even useful, but not what you need to focus on right now? And so it's sort of a checkpoint there, too, to ask yourself, how am I feeling? Why am I feeling this way? How do I want to feel? And then finally at 7.30, it's like when you're home, are you really home? Do you really feel like you're present? And these are the people you say you love and care about. Are you feeling loving and caring? And if you're not feeling the way you want to feel, what can you do about it? And do it for two weeks and just see what you learn, just to understand what's actually going on with your life in terms of feelings so that when you talk to people about their feelings and about being more emotionally intelligent, they get something to think about because they don't normally is what I find. They, they're, really, they're really sort of lost when I ask them about how are they feeling or did you, you know, is what you're feeling helpful until we have a conversation about it. Well, exactly. And I think that we're not, you know, especially these days when we're, you know, on our cell phones, you know, 10 hours a day, we're running in and out of meetings, we're busy, um, we're late, you know, the traffic is terrible. Um, you know, how often, you know, does a parent, does a teacher, does a, a manager in a company, you know, before meetings, take that breath and say, all right, wait, how am I feeling about what just happened? And is that feeling going to be helpful for the next topic that I'm going to be working on? And if not, what's my strategy to shift? Right. I don't think people, people do that kind of self-reflection 
around feeling. I th- go, 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 go. I, I encourage people to think of any conversation that's going to be challenging, whether it's a performance review or just a, a situation with potential conflict, to think about them in three parts. Like there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the beginning is you're setting the tone. And how do you want to feel in the beginning? How, what tone do you want to set? What do you want the other person to feel? And in the middle, when you've got the tough stuff that you need to talk about, how does the feelings change to being more focused and more intently aware of how your words are actually coming across and being received by the other party both ways? And then finally, at the end, do you feel respected and do you feel appreciated? And are you both walking out feeling grateful for a really... I mean, how, how do you plan for that and how do you not be better by thinking about and planning emotionally how you want to experience these conversations. And I think that what that your book is incredibly helpful for that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And thank you. The, um, and I couldn't agree more. I just think that we have not been trained to think about feeling as being central to our human experience. You know, the historical reasons, you know, for feelings where they were, you know, the, the perceptions were they're idiosyncratic, you know, their noise, you know, as Peter Salovey shared with me once in an interview, he said, you know, we used to not measure it and we thought it was the error in research. But now we realize actually it's the variance that actually predicts important outcomes. It's a very different perspective. Say more about that, if you could. Yeah, so meaning that like earlier on, you know, emotions were not seen as as experiences that could be easily measured. So what it would happen is that we would just ignore that information because right, behavior, you can measure behavior, but you couldn't measure feeling because that was in the brain and people didn't know how to access the brain back then. Um, so there's... And, so, the, and then the other thing, go ahead, and then you, you take in some, some of some philosophies around, right, the goal is to be stoic, to be still, to be measured. Right, right. Um, to not express feeling because that would show that you were affected, right? And if you show that you're affected, well, that means you're weak. It's like when, you know, I can't tell you, you know, because of my book, I'm getting a lot of emails and because of public, you know, on a book tour right now, and people come up to me and they're like, I can't believe how vulnerable, how vulnerable you are, you know, sharing about your abuse and sharing about your bullying and how you were in like a, a C and D student, you know, and um, I had one father come up to me. He said, you know, I would never, ever, you know, let my kid know about my own bullying as a child because then my child would think I was weak. And then I said to this father, oh, sorry. I said to this father, well, what, what about if your kid is being bullied right now and somehow or another, the nonverbal behavior and your actions are basically sending a signal to your son, you know, that he should not tell you. How would that make you feel? And, you know, so sometimes we have to just challenge these historical views that emotions make us weak. And actually, what this parent realizes is that, you know, you're right. Maybe I'm missing out on a lot of important information about my child's life that could make my child healthier and happier. Well, that's, you know, it's interesting about the, about what you said, said in there. Another thing that struck me, by the way, that was uh, unusual and I, I hadn't really thought about and didn't know in reading your book and learned from reading your book was that this idea of also just simply labeling what's happening actually has an effect that helps you to manage what's happening, which most people, I think you even wrote this, that you wouldn't think maybe that it would have an impact in helping you to manage that emotion, but the fact that you can actually label it. Because I think, you know, when you go to the doctor and he says, you know, where are you feeling pain or how much pain are you feeling? We don't have a lot of language for that either. And I think, but the more we understand and can describe what it is that we're experiencing, it, the better for the doctor to diagnose, but also for us to understand what's really happening inside our bodies. And I think that that came across to me when I read about what you wrote about labeling as well. Yeah, so some neuroscientists have discovered that just, you know, what they call affective labeling um, is itself a strategy, you know, to help um, deactivate the amygdala um, to help us, you know, be more calm in certain situations. You know, I would argue that it's insufficient, um, that you still need to learn strategies, right? Because sure. sometimes you, you, know, you, have to, you have to work on your self-talk or you have to just distract yourself or you have to, you know, just 
go to a freaking movie and enjoy yourself and relax. <laughs> yeah, I was just talking about that with somebody on my radio show before. I mean, I, sometimes when I when people call in and, and they're trying to get some help from me about, you know, I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling really low. I said, well, you know, what are some of the things you really enjoy doing? And then um, when, when did you do them last? And how about making a list of things that you really enjoy doing and doing them? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, there are some behavioral changes we can make that are going to impact what we're saying to ourselves and our feelings at the same time so that we can. And I, I really love the idea that, that we, you know, one of the things that I learned from Peter and Jack when I was working with them was that, you know, that um, certain feelings are better than other feelings for particular tasks. So if I want to feel more joy in my life, then what are the th- what feelings do I have to have that's going to push me in that direction and what I were I went was different than what they were what they found statistically and what they could support was that that was experiential whatever we felt drove our thoughts drove our behaviors and I thought well if I know that the feelings that I'm having are driving my thoughts and behaviors and I realize that there might be better feelings than the one I'm having for what I'm trying to get done then I want that to be strategic why not ask yourself what do you want to feel here when you're, you know, going to have a meeting and you need to be prepared and confident, or you're going to be presenting an information for a new product, and how do you get people to feel like you're, you know, how are you going to influence them? What's going to be motivational to them? And think about planning emotionally how you want people to feel and how you want to feel yourself. That, to me, knowing what emotions are going to be best for certain situations, that, I mean, that, that's what the roadmap's about. It's about being strategic about what are the feelings that are going to be most helpful to you and if you're not feeling them how do you get there i couldn't agree more i think that we underestimate the power of what's called ideal affect and ideal affect is ideal feelings in terms of what's most appropriate what's most useful to the person at the time exactly we focus oftentimes on how we currently feel but sometimes our decisions are based upon how we'd like to feel, um, both in a negative and a positive way, right? So, you know, for kids, they ideally want to feel happy, and they think that the pathway is taking drugs. <laughs> you know, that's not a good strategy to right. that goal. <laughs> right. So I think part of it is helping people evaluate, um, like in our work in organizations, whether it be a school or a classroom or a company, is we ask people a simple question. Not you know, let's try, let's move away from having rules constantly in our classrooms and schools, and why don't we just ask people a simple but profound question: How do you want to feel? And come up with a list of emotions that they want to experience more frequently in their workplace, and then work towards doing things that will create those feeling states. Why don't it sounds so, it's deceptively simple. Well, Mark, could, yes. could be, be uh, you know, I want to manage the time appropriately. And I, one of the great things I think that you've done is this mood meter and how you're using it and with the app that you have. And do so you want to talk a little bit about that, too? You do talk about it in the book, but I know there's also an app that maybe you could say a little bit about because I think it's a great technique as well. Yeah, so the mood meter is a tool um, that is built upon decades of research on emotion. Um, and David Caruso, our colleague, um, had a version of that in his book early on with Peter Salovey. And together what we did is we adapted it to be more friendly in terms of you know having the four colors, the yellow, the red, the blue, and the green. And what we find that is helpful about it is that it takes the complexity of your inner life, meaning like I just like all over it. Like some woman last night I gave a talk here in Seattle, and she goes, I'm feeling 20 emotions. And I was like, well, that might be a mental illness, just so you know. <laughs> That's a little, you know, four or five, okay, but 20? I mean, come on. But my point is, is that you can take your inner life that's complex and just, for at least right now, project it onto these four quadrants, right? Yellow meaning the high-energy, pleasant emotions of, you know, happiness, excitement, um, optimism, hope. The green being the pleasant but low-energy emotions like contentment, tranquil, peaceful, serenity. The blue and the green being unpleasant emotions, and I want to make a really important point, unpleasant but not negative, um, or negative emotions, as we like to say in the field of psychology, but not bad emotions. We tend to classify and be afraid of these red and blue emotions, but the truth is they're very adaptive for certain situations. We just don't want to feel them all the time. Right. So the blue is unpleasant 
low energy, sad, disappointment, and then the red is the anxiety and the anger family. So what we find very helpful is for people to, using that ruler acronym, they just first like kind of just do a basic kind of diagnosis of like, what color am I in right now? Don't even try to figure out, you know, what the feeling is or what the cause is. Just, just go with a, this like feeling, this gut feeling in terms of what's, what is your brain kind of telling you? Are you feeling pleasant, unpleasant? Is your energy high or low? And then from the quadrant, you can say, all right, well, what's happening for me right now that I'm in this quadrant? Oh, well, I'm on the phone with Chuck doing an interview. I'm feeling excited. Or I just got really bad news. Oh, I'm feeling disappointed. And that questioning to the understanding of emotion is what guides you and helps you to get the best label. Um, and so that's the R, the U, and the L. And then the E and the R is, okay, so do I have the permission or the privilege to express these feelings? Um, because truthfully, I think especially in the workplace, people are really are afraid of expressing many of their true feelings. Right. Because they don't want to be judged. They think they're going to get fired if they disagree with somebody or if they're feeling angry at the way they were treated. They don't really feel like they can share it because, you know, it's not going to, nothing's going to happen with it. They're going to get fired. Um, and then, so then the question is, well, what do I do to regulate? Do I come up with a strategy to, you know, calm myself down, to script the conversation? Um, so that's how we, we take the mood meter and we really apply the skills, of, the ruler skills to it as a way of helping people develop, you know, the full range of skills from just basic recognition to labeling to regulating. Could you tell a little bit of the story that's in the, that's in the book about the person who was teaching uh, emotionally disabled children who was getting bruises and not reporting them because you didn't want the kids to be expelled, but the introduction of the mood meter kind of turned that all around? I thought that was a great story. Yeah, well, it's an example of why, you know, you know this is a school where it was always about crisis intervention, which obviously is necessary in some situations, but there was no prevention. There was no skill building. So once we gave the children in the school um, labels to describe their feelings, what happened is that they knew when they were feeling peeved or irritated or um, uncomfortable or uneasy as opposed to enraged and livid. And they could then raise their hand and say, I need help now. I need a strategy now to support me in managing my feelings. And so that's a prevention model, right? That's saying, let me manage the little feeling before it becomes the big feeling that becomes, you know, very difficult to deal with. And so the teacher shared with me that after a year of doing this work, like just everything changed about her relationships with the kids, that, you know, she would go home with wealth in her bodies in previous years from kids throwing chairs and being really, you know, having troubles with emotion regulation, and that that dramatically changed just as a result of giving them words and strategies um, for their feelings. So, it, I mean, to me, it's it's kind of remarkable that when you, and this is what I was saying earlier, Mark, about the, you know, the pain metaphor, where if you know and you're able to label and understand that you're on this, and I, I think of this as a pathway, if you're on a pathway that you know and you recognize early on that you're on, and you know it never ends well, this is my concept of a roadmap is then then you got to take a different path. I mean, shame on you if once you realize that there are certain things, and I think you talk about them as, in, in your book as triggers, things that we know that certain that send us down a certain pathway, and we and the pathway always ends poorly. And yet we, we're on it, and we're, we're, we're going really fast on it, and some, a piece of us sort of knows it's wrong, but here we go, and we crash and burn again. And yet if you can catch that early on, which it sounds like what's happening with the mood meeting with these kids in this classroom, is recognizing, hey, we're starting to be at the beginning of the path, but once we know we're on it, we're able to talk about it and deal with it in a much more effective manner um, than in the past where we just crashed and burned at the end. That's exactly right. That language is power and strategies are empowering um, so that we have, you know, control over our feelings. And, you know, when I was a kid, because I was, I'm, I think, more genetically, biologically prone to be anxious um, and I was 
in very horrific situations that were activating for me. I did, all I did was act out and cry and scream and do whatever I was doing. And I didn't, I didn't know there were strategies. Like no one ever taught me like to change the way I think <laughs> right. or challenge my thinking. No one taught me to take, you know, low, you know, slow, deep breaths to help me, you know, calm my nervous system. No one told me that like having a caring, loving adult just sit with you and have a conversation was going to help me, you know, deal with my feelings. And so what happens, I think, oftentimes is that, you know, in parent-child relationships or teacher-student relationships is that kids, when they're experiencing these strong emotions, you know, they yell, I hate you, I don't want to, you know, leave me alone. And that triggers the adult. The adult then doesn't have the skills, and so they yell back or they punish. And so nobody benefits, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, whereas when the adults have the language and the strategies to manage, they can be the role models for the kids. And, you know, we talk about emotions as being approach or avoid, right? That strong, positive emotions are saying approach, approach, support. Strong, negative emotions are indicators of avoidance. So disgust, anger is typically a signal, right? Stay away. Unfortunately, um, that does not apply to children. All emotions are approach emotions. Interesting. Meaning, right? So no matter what your kid is feeling, right, it's okay. Like, their feelings are their feelings. So you have to, as the adult, just be mindful that it doesn't matter if they're yelling, I hate you, I hate you. There's something deep under, underneath there that really is saying, I need your love and support. And that's hard for people who have not had training in emotional intelligence because their emotions get the best of them. Yeah, it's true. It's interesting. One of the people in the in the uh, presentation I made yesterday um, we asked a question. They said, you know, in, in, in her company, um, growth mindsets are being talked about all the time as the answer to anything that ails you. <laughs> um, and that if, you, if, if we're having a conversation and the other person doesn't seem to get what we're saying, it's because you don't have a growth mindset. If you had a growth mindset, <laughs> and, you know, it's funny because what I said was, I, I, th I think it's a great insight because I was talking about how in the way I think about things these days is that emotions drive thoughts, drive behaviors. And when you're doing something crazy, like when you see people texting while they're driving or something insane, and yet they look like they're dressed up and they look like they might be well-to-do people, and you wonder why would somebody do anything like when, when it's when we know it, there's nothing rational that could explain it and anyway her point was and she she said how do we how do we get past this just saying it's a growth mindset i said well one of the things you want to understand is what are the thoughts people are saying that cause that fixed mindset and what are the feelings driving those thoughts because until you understand any of that just saying they need to have a growth mindset isn't going to change anything that's why i think about it anyway i couldn't agree more and, you know, you can't just tell someone to have a growth mindset, right? <laughs> right. You've got to reinforce the principles behind growth mindset. And obviously, that, that terminology around growth mindset applies very much to emotion regulation because we fail frequently when we regulate our feelings or when we try to. I can't tell you, like, here I am, the director of the Center for Emotional Intelligence. I'm at home with my family. I get activated and I start like losing it. And even in the moment when I'm like losing, I'm like, Mark, you know, you know all these strategies. And I say to myself, yeah, I know them, but I'm not going to use them now. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then it's like, oh. So, well, listen, at least it's a conscious decision, Mark. <laughs> I know, but it's not a good one. I know. <laughs> and uh, it's fascinating how like here we are having the skills and know, knowing the skills, but can't, can't, not able to apply them. Well, here's right, in he, that. Here's a funny story, Mark. One day I walked around, I, you know, my, I, one of the things that I struggled with when I first was learning about my own emotional abilities was I didn't have a high emotion management score. And of course, right away I said, I hate this test, which of course indicated I don't have a high emotion management score. But one of the things that I did was I learned from that and I tried to understand if this was true, where might it show up? And it, oh, it, where I, I recognized that I, it's, I had struggle at times is when something internally with my family isn't working. Not so much with clients and with, with you know people that I'm doing business with. That's fine normally. But the people that I love and I care most about, if I'm saying to my daughters that, hey, you know, if you do this, it's really going to cost you. This is not, this is not the right thing to do. They say, well, I know, Deb. It's my life. I'm going to do it. No, you're not. <laughs> I just can't accept it. So one day when I, I took my oldest daughter and I said, why don't we go for a walk? And uh, we're in a nice neighborhood. We walked around about a mile 
And I think I talked nonstop about all the things I, I thought that life would be better if she would only do things this way. And when we got around and we finished and we had finished the mile, she looked at me and she said, Dad, so did you think that was emotionally intelligent? <laughs> I said, no, okay, why don't we go around again? Let's try it again, you know? So exactly. I, I think part of the time, you know, you'd like to think that because you understand how all this is supposed to work, that you're going to make it work all the time. But, hey, we're, you know, Nothing's perfect in life, and I think as long as we're authentic and we're trying and we're doing the best we can and we incorporate as often as we can all these things that we're learning, I think that's, that's, that we, ought to be, we ought to feel good about that. I agree. Um, cool. <laughs> and, you know, again, I think, you know, the message that I'm trying to um, create, you know, in my book is that a, let's just embrace the complexities of our emotional life. Like, let's just say, yes, this is hard, and just so we don't judge it anymore. It's, you know, just say, yes, this is hard work. Um, let's acknowledge that uh, systemic models are going to have greater impact than piecemeal models, right? Developing an emotionally intelligent family is better than sending your kid, right, to an emotion counselor. <laughs> right, um, right, sure. And same thing applies to schools, right? If we're going to try to have a kid develop the skills of emotional intelligence and the adults who are surrounding that kid, you know, have to be learning them and applying them. And, and then I think the, the, the complexity piece coupled with the systemic piece gives us the permission to fail, to forgive, to apologize, to repair, um, and recognize that this is life's work. I mean, I don't know how old you are, Chuck. Maybe you don't want to share. But, I'm so, uh, I'm going to be 72 soon, Mark. There you go. So do you think that you could still become more skilled at dealing with some of your uh, stress or whatever feelings you're having that are not the most conducive? Every day there's a chance I'm going to learn something that's going to make me better. Absolutely. Exactly. So you've got 22 years on me. And, you know, the moment I think, Mark, you've got this, like you are the feelings master. The <laughs> next day, you know, I'm doing a presentation and someone challenges me in a way I've never been challenged before. I'm activated, I'm caught off guard, and I'm insulted, and I want to just, like, go for the jugular. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, all right, like, try more, come on. So I just think we have to recognize that the emotion system is very different than the cold cognitive system. And what I mean by that is that, you know, two plus two always equals four, but how I um, manage my anger today may not be the way I manage my anger tomorrow based on things like sleep and exercise and nutrition and relationships. So I just think it's about just acknowledging that. Right. And I think your point about sometimes something triggers you that you, you you haven't really been triggered by before. So you didn't know how to prepare for it. And so you don't necessarily handle it as well as you'd like. And if you drive yourself nuts by being a perfectionist, it just only it kind of, you know, builds on itself and just causes you to go to a downward spiral. And if you can understand that, hey, this, you know, I, I want to forgive myself. I didn't handle it well. I know I didn't. This is a new trigger for me. And I learned from that. And I need to understand when that trigger happens again what am i going to say different what am i going to do different because it may happen again and i want to be prepared this time couldn't agree more i think this is the uh this is we just have to this is you know the way our emotion system operates and obviously if we support children early on in their development and um you know build that emotional intelligence muscle you know, by giving them scenarios and language and strategies to practice from early on till adulthood, of course, it'll be better. And I actually, you know, sometimes think about this, like I'm envious of the students who go through Ruler because I didn't go through Ruler, right? I just built the curriculum with my colleagues and implemented it and I've learned it as I've implemented it. But like some of these students that I get to meet who have had training in Ruler from preschool to third, fifth, eighth grade. I've seen now, you know, 10 years of some of these students. You know, it's just mind-blowing about how they think about feelings and how they regulate them. You, so, had, a, you, had, a great, you had a great story about a child who wrote a note to his younger brother about what dad was feeling when his younger brother went to bed so unhappy. You want to share that one? Because that's a great example of that, I think, Mark. Yeah, so this was a, a parent who was being activated by their they had two children, and the one kid really activated the kid, and 
the kid was sent to his room and the kid was crying and screaming and the other older brother was in a school that used ruler and he wrote a little brother a note you know about how he could take a breath and how he could do this and he gave him an idea like daddy just had a bad morning um and you know then the parent found that note you know and was just blown away you know here i was you know this father who was dysregulated and there i am having a child you know a seven-year-old son who is now helping my other son regulate you know his emotions you know that's a wake-up call for you know a parent yeah, and, the dad. I think you said they were even they were even schooled in in ruler. They had had some exposure to it, but actually see their son, their older son, use it to help the younger child deal with dad who was out of control a bit. I think that was a great story. Yeah, and I, you know, it's amazing. You know, I was just recently uh, giving another talk, and a mom came up to me, and uh, she said, you know, her son. She was taking her son to the dentist. And he's in, I think he was in second grade. And he was saying, Mommy, I'm really nervous. I don't want to go. I'm scared. And the mom was like, not really sure what to do, but she had just read my book. And she said, well, honey, you know, what would you tell your best friend, Johnny, you know, who was going to the dentist and feeling anxious? And he said, well, I would tell him, don't worry. It's going to be okay. And, you know, all these different fun things he would say to him. And then his mom said to her, his mom said to her son, so, honey, maybe you could try those strategies for yourself. And then the son said to his mother, he goes, Mom, you're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I just love that story because, you know, the mom was caught, you know, would have been two weeks earlier before learning about these skills. Like, you know, she would have been nervous for her son because her son was nervous about going to the dentist. And she'd probably tell him to calm down or to say it's going to be okay. But you can't tell someone it's going to be okay, right? Right. And having him come up with the strategies for himself is, you know, what this work is all about. Because as he was coming up with what he would suggest to a friend, he was really creating a suggestion for himself. That You know, that's that University of Michigan strategy, right, for third-person coaching yourself. You know, I, yep. I, I, you know I, I saw Ethan talk about that one time, and, I, and I've tried that a few times, you know. So, so Chuck, if, if, it, if it wasn't you and you were advising somebody else, Chuck, what would you be saying to them and, and then saying that to myself? And it's, an, it's interesting because it gives you a different perspective, and it's another one of the strategies that you talk about in your book that, again, I encourage all those of you out there, if you – if you're looking for ways to be smarter about being emotionally intelligent, I think, Mark, your book, Permission to Feel, is a great book. And I also like when you said earlier, um, when you do make a mistake, that you also want to feel, have the permission to fail, <laughs> F-A-I-L, <laughs> because uh, that yeah. allows you to know, hey, we're, we're not perfect. We're going to make some mistakes on occasion. This is just, this is, we're human beings. We're not robots. And... Um you know, the, 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 I think the hope is that over time we do less harm to ourselves and others. Um, and I think the way we can do that in terms of building and maintaining positive relationships, in terms of achieving greater mental health and well-being, you know, and especially, you know, achieving our dreams and goals in life, right, is spend time working on the skills of emotional intelligence. To That's me, that great. That has been, you know, one of the major contributions you know, to the field and also to my own development. Well, again, Mark, I, I know having met your uncle, I'm sure you'd be incredibly proud of where you've been and where you're going and what you're doing because it, it's, I mean, it's knowing where you started from and, and how much you've accomplished since then, it's just amazing. Congratulations on the book and, and all the really success you're having. Thank you so much, Chuck. It was great to talk with you. Okay, you too. Have a good rest of your day, Mark. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.